Hey, welcome everyone to the Beast Gear Podcast. Today, I'm joined by former NFL defensive lineman and Super Bowl champ, Derek Wolf. Derek is an avid hunter, father, husband, and workout enthusiast, and more. Derek has been a big advocate for hunter land access in his home state of Colorado and continues to give back to his community through his Wolfpack Foundation. We're excited to sit down with Derek, talk about family, hunting, athletics, and life. Hopefully learn a few things along the way. Please join me in welcoming Derek to the show. So, yeah, let's get into it. Derek, how you doing? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. No problem. I want to talk a little bit about your, your athletic career and kind of how it started off. Um, when you were younger, you know, obviously you're a big guy, but as a kid, how did how did things start out for you as far as athletics and sports? Did you have people in your family that were interested in it? Did you uh, come into it on your own? Were you the first athlete in your family? Were you one of many? Like, how did it yeah, sort of was, start out? I was, I was the first athlete in my family, first and only, actually. Um, and my family's, I mean, I don't know, though. I don't know who my real dad is, though, so who knows? He okay. could be an athlete. You know, he could have a bunch of athletes out there. Who knows? But, um, you know, I, I was the only athlete, really, in my family. Like some high school football players and stuff were around. But um, I watched that. Super Bowl between the Denver Broncos and the Green Bay Packers in 1997 and I was seven years old and that was my first year playing football and I was like okay. that's what I want to do and I watched Reggie White carry that Super Bowl trophy around in 96 you know the, when they won the Super Bowl in 96 the, the Packers mm -hmm. and watching uh, Reggie White carry that carry that trophy around with his with the Super Bowl t-shirt over his jersey that will forever be ingrained in my mind because I was like that's what I want to do I want to do that and I want to feel what that feels like. And it's crazy, like how many people can say that they like, you know, that's like a kid seeing an astronaut, you know, take off on a spaceship as a kid and being like, that's what I want to do. And then he gets to do it. And he's like in that moment, like I'll never forget being in that moment, like running around the field with the Super Bowl, tro Super Bowl t-shirt with a Lombardi trophy in my hand, running around the field like that. I was just like, Holy Thank shit, you. I did it. <laughs> I, I got it. I can't believe that this actually happened and came tr and came true. But, you know, it, it took a lot of hard work and went through a lot of stuff in between there. And um, the one thing that always stayed true, though, was that I just was like, OK, if I just work my ass off, like I'm going to be everything's going to work out. Um, you know, I had an opportunity to play in a Super Bowl and was injured and didn't get to play in the first one we made it to. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know if we'd ever make it to another one. But I just stayed true to that. Like, hey, you know, just keep grinding you know, keep your head in the game. Like, don't get distracted by all the other bullshit and the outside noise and everything will work out. And, you know, it, I was, I was, I started playing full contact football at seven years old. And from the second I stepped on that field, it was like, you know, I'll never forget. I like, I like twisted my ankle real bad. I'm like one of my first games. And um, I'll never forget my coach coming out there and just being like, get up. <laughs> and I was like, all right, like, we don't, we don't like, that's just like a mindset thing. You know, this, this isn't for, this game isn't for everybody because it is so physical and you have to have a different mentality, you know, positions are different, right? Like if you're a quarterback, you're not going to have the same mindset right. as a defensive lineman, but I was always a defensive player. Um, I played running back too when I was a kid and stuff, but it was always, my coach would be like, I didn't want to do it. And he'd be like, Hey, the quicker you score a touchdown, the quicker you get to go back on defense. And I would be like, okay, cool. So right. that's, that's how I looked at it, you know, but I was always defensive. I always played linebacker, defensive line. Like that was always like see ball, get ball was always really fun to me um, because it's like this, they, they don't know you, when you're not, you don't know what they're doing, but you can make like educated guesses. That was always like really fun to me. Like, and as a game went on, you would start to see tendencies. And I would just like, I just naturally would remember seeing like a backfield setter naturally remember seeing like how somebody moved and it would be like, okay, this is that play. And I would just go and attack. And there was no hesitation there. So it, and it just took, it took time to like, to really fall in love with, it didn't take any, a lot of time to fall in love with the game is what I was trying to say is that, you know, it was right away. I fell in love with it right away. So this is, this is, it's good. This is interesting. So as a young athlete, what, cause I feel like this is, this happens for a lot of people. When you first started, what do you think mentally 
mentally it provided for you? Like that first day of practice where you said you fell in love with it instantly. Um, a lot of people say, you know, athletics, they can provide us with a home, a tribe. They can provide us with confidence. Yeah. Like when you think about who you were as a kid, maybe things that were going on in your head, you know, at home in life, like what did practice, what did going to practice and being around that environment kind of provide for you uh, initially? And then, yeah, you know, it, provided, that... it provided, I know exactly what you're getting at, but it, it provided, it provided a family atmosphere that I really wasn't getting at home. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it was, I come from an abusive household um, alcoholic mother and an abusive stepfather. So I, I was like, I had a lot of rage that I had to let out and I got to like control that rage and let it out on the field. And then also, um, the praise that you would get from a coach when you did it, when you did something right, sure. you know, like it doesn't have to be like a big play in a game. It could be just doing the drill, right? Like just doing the drill, right. And your coach being like, there you go. That's how I want to see it. Like getting the, getting those small little praises were like, that was everything to me. You know, that's like, that's what got me up in the next morning and got me going the next day. And uh, that's the only reason I went to school and cared about class because you, you had to have the grades to play football. And it was like, okay, I just, I'm everything I did in life was just to make sure I could play football because I yeah. loved it so much. I loved, I loved, I felt like if I didn't have football, then I wouldn't have any kind of family, you know? And I, and it was like, no matter what team I went on, I was playing on, it was like, I, I found a brotherhood you know, there's some kind of brotherhood to be found and camaraderie and, you know, your coaches end up being like your father figures. And, and that's just, it, it was like that at every step of the way, even in the NFL, you know, my, my defensive line coach in Denver, he's like, you know, he was like a father to me, you know, Bill Kohler, he, you know, he's from Warren, Ohio, and he's, he's just sure. like, we get along really well. And, you know, growing up, growing up in Northeast Ohio, like it's football and hunting. Like football, hunting, and wrestling are the three most important things. <laughs> like, oh, we'll get we'll get into talking about yeah. wrestling at some point. Yeah, so it was that was for me my my escapes were you know hunting and um and football and that athletics it doesn't have to be just football like it could be any sport you know can can give you those those same feelings and those same meaning um you know I always I was always envious of kids that like their whole family would come to games and stuff like that but. I, you know, something, it just something about being there by myself and not have like, nobody was pushing me to do this. I was doing this because I wanted to do it. And then I yeah. saw a lot of really good players quit because they just didn't want to do it anymore. And they were being pushed too hard. So I'm, I'm almost grateful that I didn't have one of those dads that was like down your throat all the time. You know, I did it because I loved it and I wanted to do it. It wasn't because I was being forced to do it. It is a, it's a delicate thing when you're, you have daughters now and you're, if they get into any activity and you're trying to mentor them and guide them, um, I, I feel like what, you know, the thing that you're speaking of is this self drive, this thing that you found within football. Um, and many, I see this in people that get into like way deep into hunting in the outdoors as well. There's, there's a pull to it. There's oh, yeah. a pull to it that speaks that speaks to their soul, right? And they find this camaraderie. Um, I, it's awesome that you mentioned like coaches and people early on in your life that that mentored you. I think a lot of people feel that same situation. Um, I, I, I've coached for a long time in wrestling, but I know the, the mentors that I've had and other coaches, they should all know like the unbelievable influence and impact that they can have on people's lives. Um, when you mentor someone and work with them, and it could be just little statements, like you said, during practice where they said, good job on a drill, um, or that changes the whole frame of mind of a kid's day, a kid's week, a kid's life. Yeah. Um, so it's this weird dynamic and I'm sure you're going to experience it now that you've gone in your life, you've gone through this sort of cycle of growth and prosperity, and now you have a family. Um, do you think about in raising your your family now? Like, how are you gonna how are you gonna instill in them some of the values that you got from growing up under that harsher environment, but also, you know, help them be successful? You know, because they're they're growing up in a completely different environment 
you know. Yeah, and I, I think so. The way I look at it is, <clears throat> and I str- it's a struggle because, you know, especially with m- my oldest is more of like an intellectual, and she just like excels at at this stuff. Like she played lacrosse for a little bit and then was really good at it, but she didn't love it. And I was like, look, if you don't love it, I'm not going to make you do it. Right. Like I'm not going to like it's not my job to coach effort. Like I'm not going to yell at you for not playing hard or not trying hard. Um, if you don't love it, then don't do it, you know, and that's okay. And she was like so much happier, you know, thought she was like going to be letting me down or something. She was so much happier yeah. knowing that I didn't care. But now my youngest, she is like super competitive, wants to win everything. I mean, you can't even ask my oldest about her day. My oldest is 16. And my youngest is four and a half. So you can't even ask my oldest about how her day was without my youngest being like, hold on, let me tell you about my day first. <laughs> she has to, like, she wants to be first and comp- she's competitive. You know, she, she dance, she does dance. She does gymnastics. She does martial arts. Um, she's going to do soccer this summer. Like she's all about doing any kind of sport she can possibly do and trying to be the best at it. But she also has like, just like every other kid has is when things don't go her way, she wants to quit. So it's like, I'm not, I just don't let her quit. Like when it gets hard, I don't let her quit. And I struggle sometimes because we'll be in like this in some silly martial arts class where they're just working on like front kicks and just goofy things, you know, and she's not. And if I see her goofing around, she'll look back at me and I'll just give her a look and she'll like, oh, she she like takes it, you know, she straightens up, takes it serious. Like, hey, if you're going to be doing this, I I explained to her even at at four and a half years old, she understands that I'm like, hey, if you're going to do this, try it. Just try. That's all I ask is just try. Like if you don't do it right, it's okay because you can get it right the next time. But if you don't try, if you're not even trying to do it right, you know, that's that's what makes me angry. Like that's yeah. why I'm that's why I'm getting that's why I'm upset. Like that's why I'm telling you, that's why I'm upset. I'm not upset because you didn't do it right. I'm upset because you're not trying hard. Yeah. And that's and then now she's like, she just wants to see that she wants me to see that she is trying hard on everything that she does. So it doesn't matter what it is, she's always looking to make sure that I'm, I'm watching. So I may, you know, it's, that's the other thing. Now you have this responsibility of being at everything that she does. She wants to know that you're watching. Um, and you know, when I was, no matter how, how well she did in the class, whatever class it is, I always tell her, Hey, you did a great job. You did a great job because you tried. And that's all I care about. Like, all I care about is that you tried hard. Like, I don't care if you won, you lost any of that, but if you tried your hardest and played hard, and practiced hard and did all that, like, and prepared hard. That's, that's all I care about. Um, same with, and the same goes for my oldest with her, with her school. Um, you know, she's in DECA and all the, and, and FBLA does all these things that I never even heard of when I was a kid. Now she's like the vice president of it. And, you know, she's got like a 4.2 GPA. And I was like, I didn't know you could get above a 4.0. That's crazy. <laughs> you know, and so it's, uh, you know, then that's why I tell her, I'm like, you know, she gets upset if she gets like an A minus or like a B plus or something. I'm like, yeah, but did how, like, I saw, I, I saw you studying. I saw mm-hmm. you weren't on your phone, TikTok, and you weren't, you know, bullshit. And you were right. like taking serious. So the fact that you tried is all that matters. You didn't just like, you gave it, you get, you did everything you possibly could to set yourself up for success. Yeah. Um, and that, and that is like a lesson that everybody should have. Um, it's, it's especially important in the, in the outdoors. Like you have to prepare to fail because you're going to fail a lot more than you succeed. So you have to be prepared to like deal with that, that failure, like that mental failure, uh, you know, of just not being successful. You know, you might spend five to seven days on an elk hunt and come out of there with nothing. You might not even draw your bow back. And you could be, and you could either be disappointed or you can see, be like, okay, what did I do wrong? You know, yeah. what, what did I do wrong? Uh, you know, that's what I always try to teach them. I'm like, Hey, what could you have done better? Like, what did you, what went wrong? Right. Don't just like get mad and blame everybody else, you know, because that's the easy thing is to point the finger at other people, but what did you do wrong and what can you improve on? So like, yeah, it is, it is a struggle to like try to, I don't expect them to have the same, you know, blind rage of drive that I had where like nothing else mattered. I don't expect them to have that. And I don't sure. That was my only way out of my situation. They have so many other opportunities than I had. All I want them to do is like take advantage of those opportunities that they have yeah. and recognize it and be grateful. And, and so those, those are the things that I try to teach, you know, my wife and I, we both push that on them really hard as well. Be just gratitude. And you're, 
You are doing me so much justice when my daughters listen to this back. They will, <laughs> you know, uh, because I, I, I profess a lot of the same things, you know, and they are very accountable for themselves in their school and their athletics. My youngest plays soccer, my oldest plays volleyball, but very similar in the mindset and thinking like you can't coach effort, show up, do the work every day when no one, no one is watching. Right. And, and be driven. You'll that, that sort of mantra trumps almost everything else. Cause you'll get people that are talented in something, right. Whether it be hunting, whether it be, you know, football, whether it be wrestling, there's talented people, but um, you can overcome a lot of that with hard work, determination, obviously using your mind to learn different, different skills and different techniques within that. So. Yeah. There's a, there's um, a great quote. There's a great, a great quote about that. It's uh, you know, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't want to work. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of talented people out there, but they just don't have the work ethic. They don't have the mindset or the work ethic to, to excel and be great. They just, they, that's why you see a lot of these guys is they peak in high school. You know what I mean? Cause they never, they, they didn't push themselves and try harder. They just were like, okay, I'm really good at this right now. And I'll just stay here. Um, which leads me to another thing. Peyton Manning told me one time, he's like, you either get better or you get worse. You never stay the same. Because yeah. the variable is other people. They're, other people are working really hard or they're not working as hard as you. So where are you at on that level, right? So I just and the environment like, is constantly changing too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Think about how much football has you know, evolved over the last 40 years. Well, it's, think. I mean, think about the last 10 years. Yeah. Like the yeah. 10 years I was in the league, it was like a whole different game. I was like, what the hell is going on here? You know, you can't even land on the quarterback. <laughs> it was just... Right. You know, it's just crazy. The the right. rules change every year. Like, so it's always moving. So you have to move with it. Um, guys are getting bigger, stronger, faster. You know, guys are more athletic. You got to be smarter. You got to do this. You got to do that. You know, it, it's, you have to be financially literate. There's all these things that go into it that, that people don't think of. It's not just being a good athlete. Right. Uh, just, just like, it's not about just, you know, being a good shot with your bow. Like, yeah, I'm a good shot. Right. But what happens whenever the pressure's on? You know, what happens whenever you've been holding it some weird position for, you know, 10 minutes, you know, and, or let, you know, sitting on one knee, you know, not able to move for, you know, 30, 40 seconds. And then you draw your bow back. Now you got to hold your bow back for two minutes and then wait for that elk to get in position. And then you're like, well, I wonder what the range is. And you have to guess the range. And like, there's all these things that happen that, you know, you don't think about when you're in your backyard, just shooting at your same target you shoot at every day and you're like i wonder why i missed it's because you didn't put yourself in those situations um you have to you have to prepare yourself and you know i do that by just like i'll just take my bow into the gym with me and i'll just do these crazy workouts and get my heart rate and get my arms as tired as possible and my legs as tired and be shaky and breathing heavy and pull my bow back and just try to make a good shot at 20 yards like just try to get it in the dot. And then there's a punishment for me if I don't make it in the dot, you know, I got to go pick up this 200 pound ball five or six times or something, you know, like it's things like that. Do you, I want to know if you think this in your head, do you feel like, you know, a lot of people would say, you know, Derek, you played football your whole life. You you wrestled, you you reached the pinnacle of the sport, the highest level. Like, why do you still do workouts like that? What, what drives you to keep going in and do it? Do you, do you get some, um, I guess, it, is it a place where physically, if you drain yourself like that, like you can, it sort of absolves everything else that's going on in the world and it just allows you to focus or what do you get out of yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. That's my, that's my happy place, man. That's like my, that's like my church, you know, the, being in the gym is like, that's like my church. And it's not just about, you know, lifting heavy weights and being a meathead. It's about like when I've, when I get myself to where I want to quit, and then I don't quit. That's, I, mean, I know that's like a lot of people are preaching that right now, but you have to make yourself sure. uncomfortable. And I love to do that. I love to make, make myself uncomfortable and then like push through it. Cause then I get like, the, it's an endorphin drop really. It's you're doing it for endorphins, you know? And I, I, think, I think it's good for you to continue to do that, to grow. That's how you grow, you know, is, is by doing shit that you don't want to do. Um, you know, there's days I don't want to get up. I don't want to get up in the morning. I just want to lay there, but I know that if I don't get up, then, you know, then I'm going to be behind. I got to get my daughter ready for school. I got to do this. I got to do that. Like I like having a routine 
Mm -hmm. Um, and some days you don't feel like doing it, but the days that you, and then when you do it, there's like, you get those little victories from that. And there's actually a part of your brain that grows when you do stuff like that. And yeah, that's those two little voices in your head and you got to, which one are you going to be today type of thing? Exactly. You yeah. Know, are you going to bitch out or are you going to do it? You know, and that's, that's just like, it's, that's the reality of life today is that too many kids are being taught that it's okay to quit. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. It, like a little, like the littlest bit of discomfort and they quit and they throw a fit and it's like, you know, all the gentle parenting going on and this and that, like, um, it's yeah, okay to feel it. some adversity and it's go through okay. some. It's okay to feel a little bit of anxiety. It's okay to fail. Okay. Like bottom line, it's okay to fail and have to yeah, restart it is. or retry. And, and there's, it, I think that social, I mean, I didn't grow up with social media, so I don't know what it's like for these kids, but I know that like they compare themselves to other people nonstop. It's hard. Um, it's that's why we hard. don't let my, we don't let my, my oldest, she doesn't have any social media. There is no social media because it's just, it's a distraction. You don't need it for social media is something you should use. Don't let it, don't let it use you. Yeah. You know, so, so don't get caught. Like people get caught up and they put their self-worth on how many likes they get on something or how much, how much, how many impressions they had or how many, like all these, all these variables that have become like a currency now that are just unhealthy. Yeah. I mean, really prior to the digital age, prior to the internet, you could detach yourself. Like you had your pods, like if you were at school or you were at work, you were around a certain group, whatever was going on, you, you were in that environment, but then you could always disconnect. Um, it's, it's more difficult now to disconnect. I mean, but there are great things like this podcast that we're doing and being able to communicate with people like this. Right. Yeah. I think for younger, younger kids that grew up with this uh, in their life, it's very difficult for them to disassociate or disconnect from that because it's, it's always present. They feel like they're going to miss out if they're not connecting to it. But I think that's another thing where the outdoors, if they could get into the outdoors, they could get into hunting, they could get into experiencing what the outdoors have to offer. You know, like this, this digital environment, uh, it can't hold a candle to it. You know, there's it's just, not it's not real. Yeah. <clears throat> it's yeah. not real. You know, what's real going, going out and hitting a trail. And I don't care if you got a bow in your hand, a rifle or nothing, but you put on to put 10 miles on your feet and really get after it and get and go to somewhere where you're like, man, not a lot of people have come here. There haven't been a lot of people here and just spend a couple of days in that environment and it'll reset you total reset. And it is like the best feeling. It is so good for you mentally that, you know, that, that's what I love most about Western, the Western hunting mm -hmm. is that, you know, there's a grind to it. it. You wake up early as hell, you get to a trailhead, and then usually you're hiking straight up a mountain. Like you're, you're never hiking down. You're always hiking up something and it sucks. And you do, it's, you start your, literally have to start your day off doing something you don't want to do. You're like, I don't want to go up there right now. You get up there, you're sweating, you're a little bit cold now. And then you sit there and you just wait for the bugles, you know, and then once the bugles start, it's like, you're hit all that. None of that matters. Let's go. Yeah. You know, and you're after them. Uh, and that, and, and that's why, you know, same with glassing, you might get up there and glass out glass mule deer, or sheep or whatever you're hunting, you're glassing all morning. And then finally you find something that's worth putting a stock on. Now you can start like the wheels start turning. Like, how do I get there? You know, what's the best way to come down on him? What are my thermals going to be like by the time I get over there? Because he might be two miles away. But so you got to think about what's my wind and my thermals going to be doing by the time I get over there. Yep. So there's all these variables that go into it that is like it's it's activating parts of your brain that you don't use when you're just mindlessly sitting on your computer or mindlessly sitting on your phone scrolling. Um, you're using parts of your brain um, that I think I think that people I know that I'm coded to go do this stuff like. When I, when I'm hunting, it is like, it's, it's like, I'm, I'm doing what I'm, I feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. There's no like yeah. unnatural feeling to it. It feels super natural for, for me to be doing it. So it's somewhere in my DNA code, the, the hunting and hunting is like in there, like I'm supposed to be doing this. And then I've, the I've heard that kid, from other that? avid hunters as well. Oh, that it's, it's like, coded. That. it's yep. coded. And when I don't get to do it for a while. You know, like the, like right now it's kind of the off season, 
you know, and it's like, yeah, you can find things to go hunt, but like the things that I like to hunt elk and I like to hunt deer and I like, those are the things I like to hunt. So you only get a short little period of the year to go do those things, especially, you know, with seasons and tags and, and all this stuff. Like, you know, really to me, it's like September and November are the two months that I get to yep. go do these two things that I really, I really love to hunt. Right. I love hunting elk and I love hunting whitetail. Um, and I'll hunt mule deer as well. I love hunting mule deer too, but I like, I like the physical grind of an elk hunt and I like the mental grind of a, of a whitetail hunt, mm-hmm. you know, cause it is a mental game that you're playing with these deer. Like it's, you, you're not going to go spot and stock deer in the middle of Kansas. Sorry. You're not doing it. I don't care. It happens, but like, I'm too big to be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm too damn tall to be sneaking around in some briar patches. Uh, they're going to spot me from a mile away. And that's just not something I'm interested in, in doing, but um, I love the mental game of it. But if you, if, if you can just like set, like set yourself up for success by training, right? So train, get yourself in shape, go out, put yourself in the mountains and put, get, make yourself uncomfortable. It will do, I mean, it'll do, there, there's science behind this, right? That yeah. And I think three days out there can set you up for a whole year. And the other thing, just, you know, people that hunt and are getting into this, getting into doing this on a regular basis, there's so many other benefits that bleed into other parts of your life. Cause like you said, if, if you set a goal that you want to train every day, maybe, you you know, maybe you put a rucksack on and you're hiking, you know, in an area to try to build up your endurance so you can get out and go further into whitetail hunt or you're, you're, working in elevation and you're doing this sort of thing that's going to bleed into how you feel better you know just doing your job just doing your everyday life um so you can kind of turn your passion into something that can have a significantly positive impact on the rest of your life um one question i wanted to ask you going back to your childhood with hunting what would you say what i've seen with other like avid outdoorsmen that when they were a kid they they sort of picked up some some instincts or some habits or some things in the outdoors that have sort of stuck with them. Are there things in your mind or experiences that you had as a kid that uh, that you've that have sort of held true with the outdoors that you use today? Like certain gut feelings or things that you've learned um, that you use today? Yeah, you can't kill them from the couch. <laughs> yeah, that funny. like always stuck with me. That no matter what you can't get you you're not going to kill anything sitting on the couch so like you know that i always i had a lot of friends that would be like oh i'm not going to hunt today the the weather's not it's not exactly how i want it to be this and that it's like well you you never know you never know when like it's it's and for me it's always those days that i was like oh i don't feel like going out today i don't feel like waking up in the morning and getting up getting up early those are the days that i always would see you know good deer you know, cause to me, I love being out. I love like, especially cause I grew up hunting whitetail and turkeys, right? Mm-hmm. And a whitetail hunting was like, you know, with a bow, it was, you know, if you're not 15, 20 yards from me, I'm not shooting at them. Right. You know, cause I, cause they jumped the string and I wasn't, sh- you know, I just, I just feel more co- and I'm shooting through all kinds of junk anyways. So, um, and I'm always hunting somebody else's property, you know? So it's like, I get to do a couple sits there and then I'm going somewhere else, you know? And it's right. like, or public land or something like we were hunting a lot of public land and, or, or it's shotgun season and you only get to go out for four or five days a year, or you get the first, they give us the first day of school off for shotgun season in Ohio. So how did uh, you balance your passions? Because being a, a former athlete and wrestling my whole life, like that bulk of that season of football, wrestling, whitetail hunting, in Ohio, like it all falls right on top of each yeah. other. Like, oh, it's, so- it's, it sucked. Like the, um, the hunting took a back seat for a long time, you know, especially once sure. I, once I got out of high school, like once I got to like high school football, it was like, there was no, you couldn't just like, I was so tired after, yeah. you know, after practice and games, there was no, like, I wasn't about to go sit in the woods for two, three hours um, and then drag a deer out of there. Like I just wasn't going to do it. And so it just like, I took a, it took a back seat and I would go do it every now and then. Like when I got to the league, it would be like, uh, you know, college, I didn't get to hunt at all because we only get two weeks off a year sure. and that was usually during the summer. So I, I, I never had time to do it, but when I got to the NFL, 
um, sometimes on the bye week it would fall in like October or November sometimes. And I would, I would sneak home real quick and, um, you know, shoot the first deer I, I, I saw, <laughs> you know, but I think it's incredibly important for people to understand that because, uh, they should understand like you can focus on other areas in your life and still have this passion, right? Like I want to get back to that, but I need to focus on this to be successful. And in you focusing on football in that portion of your life, like you built all these other skills that now in retirement, you're applying to, you know, your business, your hunting, your recreate, you know, the things, your family, the things that you're doing, like this stuff is now becoming uh, very useful in what you're doing now. Oh, absolutely. You know, just the, the, the thing about hunting is that like, like I said earlier, you fail so much. Like you're, you usually come out of there fit. Some of these units out here are like 7%, 5% success rate. And people get jacked up because it's more than two or 3%. Right. You know, it's like, it's, it's like, think about that, man. Like I, I was a, I was a defense alignment, uh, played for 10 years and I had 37 career regular season sacks. So think about how many pass plays I was involved in that I didn't get a sack. Thousands, right? you know, thousands of times I failed. Right. And it's all for that one time you succeed. And it is like this huge rush. It is the same, if not better rush when you get a good shot on an animal and then you get to walk up on that animal. It is like, it's all these emotions that, you know, and it's not a quick turnaround with animals. Um, with, with football, it was like, you made the play and then it was like, all right, next play. You know, now you're trying to, now you're chasing that next play. Now it's like, you get time to kind of, kind of sit in that feeling and that of, of accomplishment. Cause it's so hard to do. And it's just something that I just, I cherish it really. I do because that feeling, uh, that feeling of like, a failure sucks. Like it sucks to fail. Right. But it's like, you, sh- you could do everything 100% right. If that animal doesn't screw up just at least a, at least 5% screw up, you could do hundred percent. Right. If that animal does everything hundred percent, right. He's going to win. But if you can get him to screw up and usually you got to trick their stomachs or their dicks, that's the only way you're going to trick these big bucks, <laughs> you know, and, and that you have to trick them. Like you have to outsmart them. You have to put yourself in, in position to where they're doing something stupid, chasing does or they're uh, coming to food or doing something that are coming to water. Like those are the ways that you trick them. Um, same with elk. Like you got to trick them. You got to, you're not going to just sneak up on a bull elk. Like you're just not going to do it. I mean, guys do it, but it's like, you know, if you're after a big bull elk, you got to call them in. You know, you got to get them fired up. You got to play a little head game with them and call them in, keep your wind right. Do all this, all these factors that go in. Yeah. I mean, from a biological standpoint and a natural environment standpoint, they have a significant number of advantages. Oh, are you kidding me? You're I mean, going into their environment. Imagine someone walking into your house mm-hmm. and trying to get you like, I'll just shut the lights off and be able to move around here. No problem. Right. You know, but if you come into my house, you don't know where things are. You don't know what, like what walls are where, and you start bumping stuff, making noise. I'm going to hear those noises. People walk around the woods, like deer aren't going to hear them. (laughs) And as if deer don't regularly hear the common noises that are in those areas, like that are in their core areas, they, they constantly hear a pattern of noises that are normal. And when they hear something that's abnormal, you know, um, we don't really know how they retain thought. I do, uh, I'll ask you this question. Do you think, cause I believe this to be true. Like I think there's patterns of behavior cause I've seen this in deer that are passed down through, through their generations, through their genetics, because I'll see generations of deer behave similarly based on pressure, you know, based on the contour of a specific area, you know? So, um, I think there's something there with like the migrations of the caribou and in Alaska, they've traced that back to uh, the the does that actually lead the herds. And they have that, they'll have separate herds that all come together and migrate as a single group. And it's not like they're being taught that. You have fawns from the previous year that are, that are starting to lead the herd. Well, um, 
why do you think you see whitetail walking through the woods looking up in the trees? Yeah. Like they'd look up in the trees. Why would a deer look up in a tree other than the fact that humans have been sitting in trees for, you know, the last 40, 50 years trying to shoot at them. Right. And it's like, they're coded to like, look to be like, Hey, danger is up there too. You know? And it's, I think they, everything with deer, I think has to do with like survival. You know what I mean? So they're just always like on the lookout for like, what's the next threat? Mm -hmm. Like, where's the threat? That's a threat. This is a threat. Like, that's why they do. Why do, why do you think does will try to trick you into looking into moving? They'll yeah. stomp the ground or like look down and hurry up and look up again. Like Every stuff. whitetail hunter's least favorite uh, experience is when oh, a it's the worst. sure doe locks onto your silhouette and she's trying to get you to break silhouette. Oh, yeah. it's it's the worst. It'll go on for an hour. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and just like praying she doesn't blow. Or if that I've had that happen and had the buck that I was after come in and I still I can't move. Yeah. I cannot move. I can't grab my bow. I can't move. I'm stuck here in this doe. All she sees is like my bill and my hat sticking out from behind a tree. And now she's like all spooked out about it. Sure. And then, and then when I finally decide, okay, I got to make a move here. She blows and everybody's gone. And then that spot's ruined for two weeks, at least wow. <laughs> it's, you know, that's, that's just, but that's hunt. That's how hunting goes. It's funny. Cause I always get mad and people are like, well, that's hunting. You know, cause I, I, I hate hearing that. Cause it's just like, yeah, I know, you know, it's like, Thanks a lot, bud. But it is, but it's good for people to understand. And I know this has kind of been said many times to some extent, but you are, when you're going out, a lot of the, a lot of folks that follow us and do a lot of mobile hunting, right? So they're setting up their gear, they're taking it down, they're coming back out. Um, more often than not, you know, people only tend to talk about the success stories, right? Those are the things that, Hey, I, you know, I, you want to share that with your friends. You want to share that with your family, but sometimes that's 30, 40 sets of nothing burgers or, and that's why I really tell people like the true journey is all that other stuff you experience. You know, you, it's like the squirrels, the hawks, the owls, the, you know, everything else that you encounter you, know, you and I were chatting before. It's like, goofy stuff that you've seen with raccoons and everything else that takes place in the woods yeah. while you're doing a whitetail hunt or an elk hunt. There's so much other stuff going on, you know? Yeah. You just, you, you become a part of that. You become a part of that forest. You know, it's, it's like you're, mm -hmm. you're in the tree. You've, you've hiked back to, way back in there somewhere, found a good tree to get into found, you know, you did all this research once you got in there. And then you're like, okay, this is where I'm going to get. And then you get up there and then there's all the second guessing. That tree looks really good over there. There's a good trail coming <laughs> by that. Though. It's like, well, if I go over there, he might come over here. And then it's like all these games you play with yourself yep. um, where when you're going into somewhere blind, you know, like mobile hunting is, that's the fun part about it. You don't know what you're going to see. You know, you might not see shit, but you might see something and you might see something big. You might like, those are the times when you do see a big buck, like, you hear those stories all the time, more often than not, where a guy just was like, you know what? I had a hunch about this spot. So I went in there, got in this good tree, and here here comes, a, you know, this 150 buck just comes cruising. Yeah, you know? and I think, I think with the, the guys that do that year after year, that similar to how you mentioned earlier about as you developed in your football career, you started to be able to instinctually read plays. I mean, there is some to just studying formations and learning specific plays, but what you were speaking to is a, is an instinct yeah. that you were, you, you're feeling the flow of the game on the field. And I think that becomes very true for hunters as well as when they put themselves in these situations time and time again, they start to instinctually feel that pattern again. It's like this spot feels like it's right because of this this and this and then you know they're able to go to different locations and recognize have that same pattern recognition again well and you, you have the use of trail cams now so like in my experience in you know stories that i've heard of my friends you know that that are successful on big big deer that they're after if a deer does something twice you better get it twice in a row you better right. be in there the next day because he's going to, they do things in like threes, it seems like three days on, three days off, three days on. Like, it just, it seems that there's like a pattern of threes with these deer. Um, and if the wet, if it, if it's like, Hey, the weather is the same, the wind's the same. 
all the things are the same. I'm going to be in there that third day. And then, and usually they find success. They at least see that deer and he does kind of like what they thought he was going to do. But, um, you know, better than anybody that these deer get, have like a spidey sense. Yep. And it's like, he's doing it. And then something's not right. It Something is different. So they, so they don't come in, they don't do it. They just skirt you. And it's, trail it's, cameras have made it so you can be really good at this. Like if you, if you really set your trail cameras up, right. You can really be good at this, like especially guys that are hunting like their own properties or their buddies' properties or you know farms and stuff like that. You can really pattern these deer out and really understand what is happening and like, okay, why was he coming in now? Like, why did he come in this time? Because what happened when they go nocturnal? You you might get two opportunities mm-hmm. to kill that deer. Two on a buck that's over five six years old, you might get two opportunities that season where he's like going to daylight on, you know, on camera, you know? So it's like, how do you decide which days you're going to do that? Right. Well, if I catch him doing it two days in a row, I know that third day, there's a really good chance he's going to do it again. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, everything you said, there's so much, I, I, I know people that do this. Um, it's this fine line. Like I, there's a part of me, Cause I grew up in a time when that wasn't as popular or wasn't as available. Right. So there is a certain draw to knowing the topography of an area and knowing the layout of it and maybe some information about the travel pattern and trying to play that cat and mouse game and figure out how that buck is coming out of bedding or how that buck is moving through there. Right. But then when you bring technology in and we're in our modern world, if you have a family and you're working your job and all this other stuff, and you've got this small window to execute on your passion, yeah, you can't deny that understanding how to use trail cameras, understanding how to use mapping, you know, software, um, a company, Spartan Forge, that provides mapping software, they have a lot of predictive analytics in their stuff. And uh, yeah, they're doing a really, they're doing such a good job with that you know i I know some people think it's a fine line but if you are one that has a small window of time like you said to hunt during september and november the data because we're all data collectors as hunters because we're looking at the wind you know we're looking at the thermal pattern we're looking at the different topography it there's some real advantages to having that data summarized so you can be most efficient you know right you know, and then there's there's other factors that go into it too. Like understanding topography is there's an art to that. You know what I mean? Understanding what a saddle looks like, like what does this saddle really look like? Because that's a good travel corridor. Mm-hmm. So if you can set yourself up in the middle of that somewhere, find the, like find get up there, find the the highway, and then you got to place yourself strategically off of that highway that they're moving on. You know, if you find a good doe bedding area. Right. If you can get downwind from that, you know, and catch a buck cruising that, you know, there, and it's like this, it's this cat and mouse game of, okay, like, and that's what I'm saying. You're tricking them with like where they're traveling, you're tricking them where they're coming to eat. Um, you're, you know, some, some of these states like Ohio, I grew up where you could just bait. Mm -hmm. So these guys, I mean, there's guys that sit the same corn pile every year. They pot, they put corn there all year, every year. And that's where they sit. They sit there and they, and they wait for the right one. And there's like, that's fine. Yeah. I don't, I don't like doing that because it's, it's just like, now I'm sitting around a bunch of does and I don't like that. I don't like yeah. not being able to like scratch my nose. It or, takes away from some of the adventure that, but to each his own, right? Like yeah. if that's what they like to do. As I get older, I'll probably love doing that. Well, you sure. Know? Right. As we become less mobile, it's really right. like, you know, that doesn't look that bad. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, still want, I still want that experience of seeing those animals. Right. Yeah. But, what, but while I'm young, I'm going to like try to stay as mobile and move around and uh, and do what I do. You know, like it, it's almost like when I'm hunting a new area, I was hunting PA this year. Um, and I just I, I there was times where I was like, man, I should probably just go back there. But I want to see what it looks like on that other ridge. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> I want to see what that saddle looks like. Or I, and it's like, I was hunting like a 7,000 acre spot. And it was like, I just, I moved around somewhere every day. And it's like, you know, maybe if I would have just, I bet if I would have just stayed in the same spot the whole time, you know, 
I probably would have, you know, killed a nice deer, but I was like, so excited to see the property, to you know, it. to see yeah. everything. And so I did, I got to see a lot of deer and got to move around. And, you know, there was times where I was like, man, this is going to be a good spot. And it sucked. And then I was like, this probably isn't going to be a good spot. And I saw five bucks come cruising by that day. Well, so and then to that point, it's like when you're going into some of those areas new, that's where you have to sort of start to build your instinct, you know, reservoir. Like when you went into that spot that you didn't think was going to be good and you saw five bucks, then you kind of ask yourself, why was that? Like, why does yeah. this happen that way? Yeah. You know, all my, all my. Unless there was a hot dough. Right. There could it was just a hot doe came cruising through there and now like all these other bucks, but she's not going to do that tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I mean, she got chased out of somewhere out of her bedding area. So she just decided to go that way. You know, like where, the next day, where do, you go, where do you go now to sort of like, like, where are you consuming content or consuming information to sharpen yourself? Like before you go on a trip, like this trip to Pennsylvania, what was your prep from a, uh, a strategy standpoint. I mean, obviously we could go into your physical prep, um, but mentally, like, how are you figuring out maybe where you want to hunt? Are you looking at spots? Are you prep? Uh, you know, what are you, what are you doing? Yeah. So I'm looking at maps, you know, I'm looking at mapping apps. I'm, I'm looking at topography of the area. Um, usually if I'm going into an area to hunt that I have a buddy that's hunting that too, yeah. that's already been hunting it. You know, um, a lot of times I'm not just going in blind to places. Like I know that he, you know, they're keeping an eye on what's going on a little bit. And, and that's the bet, like, that's the best information you can get is by somebody that's been in there. Yep. Understands kind of what's happening there. And uh, it, it was funny because the spot that I, this, it was in Appalachia, the spot that I was at, I mean, it was like steep ridges and swirling wind. And I was like, well, what are we going to do about the wind? He's like, I'm not going to do anything about it. Anything about it. And like, he's like, you're just, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to do anything. It's just, you're kind of screwed. And I was like, oh, this sucks. But, but when it, when it comes to like elk hunting, people do not give up their spots. Like people are not going to tell you where they see elk, They're, you know, cause, cause it's so competitive. Sure. So you have to make all these decisions on your own and you don't get to use, you know, you don't get to use like the mapping stuff just kind of tells you like, oh, the, Things that the thing about elk is like people are like, oh, where are the elk at? And that's like where you find them because they can cover so much ground. And I'm talking, it's not like a whitetail where he's like, oh, he just went to the next county or something. No, these things are going 20 miles. Right. And it's just like nothing for them to do that. And they're going up and down these ridges like it's nothing. And for me to get over there, it's going to take me four hours. Right. You know, for them, it took them 20 minutes. So it's like it, you, you have to like, you have to try to, you might spend three days of a five day hunt, just locating elk. Yeah. Okay, so now I got to maximize the, I found him. Now I got to find a bull that's worth, you know, trying to get a shot on. And now I got to hope he plays, get, he plays ball. So it's like a whole different game, you know? And then it's the same thing with, with mule deer when it comes to like spotting a good mule deer. So you're, you're high country mule deer hunting, you're sitting around and you're glassing nonstop. And you're, and it's like this, you're looking at shadows and you're looking into the, that's where they're laying is in the shadows. So you're looking into the shadows and just hoping you see some antlers. So you might look at a thousand bushes and sure. boom, finally you found one and you think your mind's playing tricks on you. You know, same way with bear. It's the same thing with bear hunting. When you're bear hunting out West, when you're spotting, stalking bear, you are glassing a lot. So you spend a lot of time just sitting there glassing the landscape. So, it's funny because while I'm doing that, I'm always thinking like, how would I put a stock on an animal right there? I wonder what the wind's doing over there. Yeah. You don't know until you get over there. There's no way to just guess what the wind's doing. You can look at the leaves and stuff and try to be like, oh, okay, they're blowing a little bit like that, you know, but it's like, you know, the wind is doing something here, but if you get down, go down the mountain a little bit, I bet it's doing something different. So it's the wind is constantly changing. So you're just playing, the wind is like everything out here. Mm -hmm. out west. You know, and it's, uh, it was always everything with whitetail, but you could just play your thermals. You could be like, Hey, my wind's going up right now. My thermals are coming up so I could just stay here and I'll be fine. They're not going to smell me unless they get right underneath or right next to me. Uh, especially when you're elevated. Uh, but when it comes to these elk and deer, man, like they, if they smell you, they're gone, you know, they're just not gonna, 
Yeah, yeah, I've heard that that it becomes really apparent in open western areas, like the wind and their use of the wind and their nose, and you know, in the mornings when you get that that dew and that colder air, and then it starts to heat up and rise up the mountain, you get, you know, you get the the humidity in the air is trapping more of that scent molecules and it's rising it up, and you're getting a lot of that different stuff playing off. I mean, with whitetail hunting, there is there is a lot of that in play too, but um, you don't always get those, at least in Wisconsin, we don't always get those ranges. I mean, you can a little bit in Western Wisconsin, but not that vastness where you're, um, they're having them wind you for, a, you know, a lot of times if a, if a whitetail winds you from several hundred yards away, you probably weren't seeing it anyways, you know, you didn't you, even see him. You just heard yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, and that's, that's just the way it goes. It, it's a fun game to play, man. It's, it's, it's part of it. And it's frustrating and it teaches you patience and it teaches you how to like really evaluate a situation. There's sometimes where you're just like, I, the most frustrating spot you can be in is when you find a good, a good animal, like a good mature bull or a good mature buck or, and they're just in an unhuntable position. Mm -hmm. Like there's just no matter what you do, you're going to ruin it. If you try to go after them, there's no good way to go in there. And that is the most frustrating position to be in. You're just sitting there watching it. And you're like, well, hopefully we can find them tomorrow in a better spot. Yeah. And there's a lot of, a lot of animals. I know, you know, I haven't had experience hunting elk, but with whitetails, like they will bed in their core areas where sometimes those core areas are very much like that. Yeah. And, they're unhuntable. You can't get in there without blowing everything out. Yeah. And you don't always know that until you go in there and try to hunt it several <laughs> times, because when you're looking at it on a map, you're kind of looking how the predominant wind plays out. You're like, well, I maybe can get in there. And then. Then you start going in there and you realize it's just a thick briar patch. <laughs> yeah. You're like it. This is extremely hard to hunt them. They have all the advantages because of what I got to walk through or what I, I often, it's interesting to me to talk to other people who you know, are saying like, Hey, take a look at this map, or this is how this hunt played out and look at how this set up. And this is what this deer did because it's just like, well, I didn't really expect that. Why was he, why was he doing that? Why did, why he, did do he, that? he behave like that? <laughs> That's, or just, it amazes me how these animals, um, in a highly pressured situations, they still find ways to slip, to slip cameras, to slip, all, oh, the the cameras all the time. They're not yeah. stupid. They're not stupid. You know, like they're, people think, oh, it's a dumb deer. How hard is it to kill a deer? Because they just see deer all the time out in their yard and all this. Mm -hmm. They're not pressured there. That's why they're there. Yeah. If I was allowed to sit on your back porch and shoot these deer, they wouldn't hang out there. Right. Like right. they're not stupid. So when they smell human scent on that camera, perfect. I'll tell you a good story here. So I was, um, it was right after the season. It was late January. It was like right at the end of the, the whitetail season in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And I was, my buddy, my buddy in, at home was sending me pictures of all these deer that he had. And then they all just disappeared. He's like, dude, they're not even, sh there's nothing showing up, you know? And I was like, I had planned on, st I, I had like two days to hunt. I could stop in Ohio and hunt after the, the season was over. And then I had to come back out to Colorado with my family, you know? So I had like sure. just two days that I could hunt. And I was like, I don't care. I'm coming anyways. And he was like, well, what, where are you going to hunt? And I was like, I'm going to hunt that spot that you, that you told me about. He's like, well, there's nothing showing up, but does there. And I was like, that doesn't mean there's not bucks skirting it. Right. And he was, he's an old timer. And he was like, yeah, whatever. Like, you don't know what you're talking about, but you going to sit there. Fine. I sit there and it is like 30 mile an hour gusts and it is blow. I mean, it is ripping up out of this. I mean, the, the, at least it's coming up out of there, um, out of where I thought they were coming. And what do you know? End of January, here comes this buck that we called Forky. He had these two huge, he had a huge fork on one side and like good five on the other. Sure. It's like 140 inch deer, like 140, 145 inch deer. Well, he comes, he comes like perfect, comes busting up out of there. He was hot on a doe. They're just, a, a, some of these does come in late. Yep. And he was coming up through there and there was a whole nother trail away from where he had like where he had his camera, there was a whole nother trail coming up through there. So I'm like, these deer are just skirting your camera, dude. Like they know that your camera's right there. So they're just skirting it. And this doe comes up and skirts it. 
and she was a mature doe. And I tried everything I could to get this deer to stop. I'm like, finally, I just yelled at him and he stops and his vitals are like right behind a tree. <laughs> and I'm 35, like I'm like 35 feet up in a tree in a saddle and just getting, blo- I'm holding onto the tree, just blowing. And I got my it's bow, cold. I'm like this, going back and forth. And he finally takes a step in front of it. And I'm just like, <laughs> like, as I went back, <laughs> let it go and hit him like that too far forward. Sure. And it ended up because he's quartering away. He's quartering away. So I brisket shot him. Yep. And he ended up showing back up on He showed back up to that spot on the camera two days later. We saw him on camera two days later. So he's, he, he was on that pattern seeking yeah. because the doe were moving through there. Yeah, because yeah, they were coming through there. So it's like, okay, where the does are, just because you're not seeing that. If you're seeing a lot of does, I guarantee there's going to be a buck hanging out around there somewhere. And that's can be the one kiss of death with cameras too. Cause if you rely on them, like I'm not going to go out until I see something. Well, you have to yeah. realize that they're moving around them or maybe your camera is not in the right spot or whatever. You know, it's a delicate game with those cameras, you know, they yeah. could, it gives you, you an idea where there's deer. Like I, I like knowing that there's deer coming there, right? Like right. there's deer that are moving in there. Um, you know, I had a buddy that hunted the same deer in Ohio, this big, he's a, he's a pushing 200 inch deer, mm-hmm. pushing 200 inches. And that is a giant. Oh yeah. He'd been hunting this deer for four years now. And this year was the first year he had an opportunity to get a shot off. And he made it just made a bad shot. The deer lived because that deer was so smart that like, he would just wait till he left. He would wait till he left and then he would leave. And 20 minutes later, he'd show up on camera. Yeah. Like yeah. these bucks are not stupid. Um, it's, I had a, I had a property in Ohio. I was hunting a buck. This 160 inch deer uh, had to be one. I mean, he was 160, 170 all day. Crabby. He had crab claws coming off of his, uh, um, what is G2s? Yeah. G2s. Yep. Uh, just right here. Like these huge crabs and he had split brows. He just was a beautiful buck, cute, big, wide deer. Um, seen him all the time. Cause I had cameras all over the property and I'd see him all the time. I knew where he was bedding. And the problem was, is that the way the property came down, the property was like this. So I had a food plot up here. The property came down to a Creek down here. He was bedding over here in this really thick stuff. And my stand was over here trying to catch him coming from there. He would watch me walk down Mm -hmm. to my tree stand, get in the tree. And then all these does would come up through there, smaller bucks that I wasn't after that was letting grow. And then, I'd be like, well, it's dark. So I'd leave and I'd have to come out the other way. So I didn't blow them all out of the field. Um, I'd come up and around and this deer would come. I mean, I would get, I'd get to my truck. I'd get to the truck and or in the house and boom, my camera would go off. And that was him. He would wait for me to get up out of there and watch me walk out. And then. And that, come. Yeah. That's one of those situations where it's like you, you almost, you know, you almost have to force them out of their comfort area to get them to repattern so you can yeah. help them a different way. But the, um, the heart, if you have hundreds of acres to do that, great. But I'm dealing with yeah. neighbors who hunt too. Yeah, so you I might bump them off the property. On my prop- yeah, I got a nice buck that's on my property. I'm just like, well, I don't know what to do. And I get limited time to go hunt him. So it's like, you know, even my buddy that well, I was letting hunt all the time, he's like, dude, I can't get this deer down. Right. So he ends up bumping the deer off the property, just trying to change, doing that, doing that, trying to change his, change his pattern. We were hoping he would go to the property that was just to the uh, west of me. Sure. Hope he would go there because it's like another like three, 400 acres that nobody really hunt. Just one person hunts it and he doesn't really know what he's, he didn't really know what he was doing over there. So we knew that he would live, <laughs> you know, so we were hoping he'd go there. No, he goes across the street to this, to this like 15 acre parcel where this guy hunts every day, his kid hunts, his neighbor hunts it. Like he just has everybody hunting it and he goes over there and gets killed. Wow. And I'm just like, no, like, I can't believe that that happened, but it's like, you know, that's what it takes. Yeah. It's like, you know, maybe that, that had, that could happen in my favor as well. Right. You know, the neighbors could bump a deer, um, you know, and I thought that was going to happen because the guys, there's a cornfield when, like I said, it came here and I had the food plot here. There's a cornfield up here. And that's not my, that wasn't my property. And they would be up there just blasting all the time. And I was like, hopefully they bump something off there. Never, never bumped anything off. Yeah. That's- there isn't pressure and patterning with whitetail. It's, it's very interesting because, um, I, 
as much as someone possibly can, if you own your own land, you know, you want to try to be, I, I grew up in central Wisconsin and my mom and dad, uh, were partners in land that we worked with the farmers to, to have access to and stuff. And what was interesting is like, I hunted that place for 20 years and never fully understood till maybe the last couple of years that they owned it, that we were over pressuring it and over hunting it. Cause it was small. It was 67 acres, but when you're excited and you want to hunt, so you get out there and hunt. Um, but we would have been much better off just hitting more of our public land spots, you know, in the surrounding area and bouncing around. And then, you know, what I learned is like, if you waited and slid in there during real specific times of the year, there was a specific window in the early season, a specific window in the pre-rut, then obviously the rut, like the deer behaved a certain way. And as long as you didn't get your scent all over the property, you had a really good chance of seeing a mature buck in these, you know, it had a hill country ridge that ran all the way through it. So there was a little area where they bedded. There was a little area where they corralled dough. There was an area where they fed on the oaks. And if you sort of left these things unpressured, you could work those patterns. But it took, I mean, maybe someone smarter would have figured it out sooner. But I, it took like 20 years to figure that out. You know, I was like. If you had, are you even a whitetail hunter if you didn't overhunt an area? Like, or, right. You, yeah. Like. Who hasn't done that? Who hasn't been so jacked up and just been like, you know what? I like this spot. I know there's deer in there, so I'm going to go there. Yeah. And it's like, you didn't care about the wind. You didn't think about any of that stuff. You just went. And it's like, man, I did that a lot when I was young. And I did it a lot when I just got it. When I, when I went to Baltimore to play, mm -hmm. I rent the place I rented was on 70 acres with a soybean field and it yes. had good timber and there was deer everywhere. I mean, you'd come, I'd come back from practice and I'd, and I'd look, I'd look out in that field, like right at dusk and there'd be 80 deer in the field, like 80 of them yeah. just everywhere. And like, you, obviously it's too dark to tell if it was a buck or not, but you know, there's a buck in there, at least one. Yeah. yeah. And I just over, I hunted that place so hard and it was only like, it was 70 acres, but it was like 15 acres of timber. And I hunted a damn near every tree in that. <laughs> in that 15 acres. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I just like. I did because there was a buck that I was after that I'd seen um, from the road and I, he was out in that field. And I was like, dude, where is he coming from? He has to be coming from like, there's, there's people hunting over there. They would have known that that deer, that he, he'd be dead already. That he's got to be coming from over here where nobody's allowed to hunt. So I just like, I found every deer trail I could find and set up on it. And I dude, I couldn't, I mean, I over hunted it so much that by the end of the season, I wasn't even seeing deer. Yeah. Like, I would see like 15, 20 deer sit because they just are everywhere. They're like rats out there. And I got to the point at the end of the season where I wasn't seeing anything. And I was like, okay, I've overhunted this for yes. sure. They know, they know the wolf is walking into the woods. And yeah. Like, yeah. Like yeah. I'd go walking. I had like a nice trail cut back through there and everything. And I'd go walking on that trail and I just hear deer running away everywhere. Like I did barely make any noise. And they're just like, they didn't care. They're out of there. So what is uh, now with you? what is one of your most interesting hunts that you've done of late or something that you've, you know, now that, that you've had more time to focus on this, like what's been an adventure that's been memorable. And I guess compared to maybe one that you did when you were younger, you know, um, you know, I would, every hunt has, a, is like his own adventure, right? Like, you know, the mountain lion hunt was a, an adventure in itself. Uh, but, but my, my, but the bull elk that I was able to knock down in New Mexico, Mm -hmm. uh, not this season, but the season before, man, it was just like so rewarding to me. And so it happened so perfect the way I wanted it. The way I wanted my first bull to be is the way it went down. You know, to I had to hike hard for him. I had to go through, you know, wearing wet, soggy boots. I had to, you know, wake up, wake up, you know, 4 a.m. I had to hike 12 miles a day. I put like 89 miles on my feet in five and a half days or something like that. And it was yeah. on the last day, the last afternoon, like of the hunt that, that we made it happen. And, you know, he came up out of, he, we had two bulls that were bugling. He came up out of, he was a big five by five. He came up out of this, out of this bottom and just like, boom, just like came right to where I was calling, came right 42 yards broadside, stuck an arrow in him. Uh, ran 80 yards and died. And I was, it was like the greatest feeling 
ever, you know, and it was, it was just like this feeling of accomplishment. Cause I was like, man, this might not happen. Like, this is just like, this is tough. This is tough hunting, you know? And then, um, you know, I think of that, that mountain line where it was like, physically, I wanted to quit the whole time because it was, it sucked. I mean, it was straight up and down two feet of snow up and down these, up and down these mountains. And then, um, get, you know, dropping down on the road accidentally going the wrong way and then having to climb another 900 yards straight up to get to the lion. Like that was. So how did you guys locate the line? I mean, how did you guys locate? So you knew that lion was in there, obviously. No, been doing no, for, no, you no, didn't? no, no, we just were cutting tracks. So we're okay. just driving back roads, cutting tracks and wait, hoping we find good mature lion to, to get the dogs. on. So then once you would cut tracks, then you would backtrack the tracks with the dogs and Yep. Well, no, you just, you tell by the track if it's a mature lion or not, or if it's a female, or if it, you know, you don't go after a female, you don't go after a sub adult male. You're sure. looking for big mature Tom tracks and you can, they are very distinct. Like they stand out, right? It's just like a, like a, like a buck, right? When you see all these little doe, all these doe and fawn um, hoof prints, you see a buck track, you see a buck print, you like, that's a buck. That's a big yeah. buck. You know, you know it. And it's the same way with these lions. Same way with elk. It, it, everything has a track, right, that it leaves in the mud or the snow. And uh, you hunt these lions when you get a good fresh snow. That's what the best time to hunt. That's them. the best time to hunt them because they hold their scent. Their their tracks hold their scent. And uh, yeah, we found that, that that lion track, and I was like, "That's a big. That seems like a big cat." You know, because the ones we had seen earlier were just not were not that big. Um, and I was, and it was like, I mean, they were. It was a yeah. big track. Yeah. And we, you know, we finally got a hold of the landowner that because we had to go through his land to get to the public. Um, to hunt him. If not, we had to go like two miles around him. By then the dogs are going to lose his scent. And, sure. Uh, we were going to try it. Uh, but luckily this guy came out and was like, Hey, you guys lion hunters. And we're like, yeah, dude, we've been trying to get a hold of you forever. And he was like, he's like, you got, did you see these lion tracks? See how big he is. I was like, yeah. He's like, he's got a mule deer buried under this tree over here. Full grown four by four by four mule deer up under the tree, you know, that he had killed that yeah. earlier that day, earlier that morning. So, we knew it's he was amazing dead. the power that those animals possess to carry an adult mule deer into a tree up into elevation like it's just it just yeah. blows my mind it, blo yeah. it blows my mind and then they and then we got the dogs on him and then I th we thought he was going to get treed right at the top of the hill because i thought he was close mm -hmm. because he had to be watching his kill so we assumed he was close well, he was close, but he didn't go, he didn't jump in a tree at first. He just took off. So the dogs chased after him and we went up and over and up this drainage and then back up and then back down and then all the way back up again. <laughs> and if we were smart about it, cause we thought we were trying to get on him quick. We assumed he'd get treated quick. If we were smart about it. We went to the top and just worked that ridge and sure. waited for the dogs to get him treated, then came down on him. But no, my, of course, my dumb ass goes up and down and up and down. I'm just like, didn't know what I was doing, you know, work hard, work smarter, not harder. You dummy, you yeah. know, and, and yeah. I ended up doing a lot more work than I probably had to do, but, um, it was worth it, man. Cause it was, it was so rewarding, you know, especially when you're like, it's funny. Cause as we were leaving with that lion, as I got him out of there and I was exhausted and we're getting him out of there, there was a whole herd of sheep. All these, uh, all these ewes are sitting there just looking at us like, thanks, bud. You know, he's been terror. Yeah. Like, that thing has been terrorizing us. They have been terrorizing us. Is <laughs> took Fred and Bob and ever uh, last night. Yeah, you know, <laughs> our friends away. Yeah, restored some balance. So yeah. all my, all my, uh, all my wrestling comrades are gonna, you know, they'll, they'll beat me up if I don't ask you. So, with the sport of wrestling, so you competed when you were younger in high school. Um, I believe you said you're a state champion as well, right? No, I got, oh. I was, uh, I was, I was all, st I got fifth of state. Fifth of state. Okay. Year. Okay. I only wrestled my junior and senior year. Junior and senior year. So with what you did with football and everything, like, what do you think, what did wrestling give you um, when you compare it to like the other stuff that you went through athletically? Well, first of all, wrestling is the hardest sport that I've ever done. Like it is the hardest sport you're, you'll ever do. It is the shit you got to do to be in shape for wrestling and the hours you got to put in the grind you got to put in. Uh, but the one thing that I learned from wrestling was that there's no one else to blame. 
it's on you. If you get beat, it's on you. There's no one else to blame. There's no one. So how did they get you to go out if you started like that late and you're, what was the situation? So so the family that I started living with, Mm -hmm. um, so they, I, I can't, I did, I wrestled a little bit my sophomore year, but I didn't rest. I didn't like take it serious until like my junior, senior year. I wrestled a little bit my sophomore year, Yeah. but I was just kind of in there helping guys get ready, like just rolling around with them basically. And, uh, the family that I was living with, they were a big wrestling family. Okay. And I said, if you're going to stay with us, you're going to wrestle. And I was like, all right, fine. I'll wrestle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To make, that, that was the deal. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, fine. I'll wrestle. You know, they're like, you don't, we don't, this household, dude, they, we're wrestlers. You're going to wrestle in this house. And I was like, all right, fine. I'll wrestle. So, um, it was funny cause I had like longer hair and they cut my hair with horse clippers and God, uh, cause one of the wrestling tournaments we were in, they, they wouldn't let me wrestle with my hair. And I was like, well, what well now it doesn't like? matter. You could have a full beard and your long hair. You'd be able to yeah. Get- yeah. Um, but the one thing I learned was that like, you know, which is true in life, man, like if something, when things go wrong, the best place to point the finger is right back at yourself yeah. and, and look at, look in the mirror and figure out what you could have done different. Um, and that, Do you that think there like, are aspects of like being a defensive lineman? Cause I still help out coach at the, at the high school level. And we kind of get into this debate a lot with football coaches about the hand fighting equation, you know, the benefit of being able to hand fight and, be in your face under, like under, understanding leverage understanding body position understanding ha- how to like use your hands and use leverage against like fight pressure with pressure when to give and when to like fight back like all those things playing playing double teams wrestling made me a better a better run stopper 1000 percent um creating angles on people for takedowns that's pass rushing you're creating an angle on that offensive lineman there's a, you're cutting the corner on him. You're trying to create an angle, an opening to take, and that's wrestling. You're create, you're, you're circling to try to create angles. Like you just circle, 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 trying to create angles. And that's, that's what, that's what pass rushing is. Um, if I was an offensive lineman, I think basketball would be better. Yeah. Like a tackle. If I'm a left tackle, being able to like cover space and stay in front of somebody. And like guards and move like side yeah. to side. Yep. But if I'm like an interior defensive lineman, it's, you know, interior defensive line, you, you should wrestle. Wrestling is what you should be doing because that's what it is. It's a hand fight and a wrestling match. And it's like this violent game of chess that goes on in, say, in those trenches. So that that's my, like my suggestion for interior guys is always wrestling. Yeah. Very good. Very good. So what else? What is, what is, uh, what does a regular workout pattern look like for you? I know you're a pretty busy guy with your family and everything, but what do you try to hold yourself to now, you know, as kind of a standard thing to, to either maintain, or if you're training up to an event, kind of wrap, wrap it up. I know you like to share a lot of your workouts and you do a lot of different dynamic stuff. Um, but what does a regular day look for, look like for you? Yeah. So I, so I'll wake up, um, get my daughter ready for school, take her to school, eat some food. Then I get to the gym about 10 AM. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'll do some days I'll do like, uh, it's like Mondays I'll do like a full body strength day. Um, and then I'll mix like a little bit of cardio in there at the end. And then so when uh, you're doing a full body strength, is your pace a lot slower and you're no, 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 I get, I get a lot of, I, I don't, I take like, the longest I'll take in between a set is like 90 seconds. That's okay. the longest. And that's if I need it. I take as much rest as I need when I'm doing those strength days, but like sometimes I don't need a full minute, you know? So I'll just go whenever I'm ready, you know, that's when I go or if and, I'm, and then I do like the, and then I'm like, so Monday, Tuesday, I'll do strength, like push. I'll do like a pull day on Tuesdays. So I'll do like cleans, like heavy cleans and heavy trap bar pulls. And then some auxiliary work and stuff like that. Um, and then on Wednesdays, I always do conditioning, heavy conditioning. So it'll be like uh, push the sled, push the sled down. And then uh, in the first, so I'll do like EMOM. So every minute on the minute. So I'll have to get yep. something done within that minute. And so I usually get like 20 seconds of rest before the next thing. Mm-hmm. And it could be like, uh, you know, jump rope, or it could be burpees, it could be push ups, it could be, um, I, there's all kind. Of, I, I'll use these heavy sandbags and like lift those up and carry them, have to sure. carry it back or something. Are, like do that. you have a tendency, like when you go in, because obviously you've had 
a full career of doing a variety of different workouts, like where you'll just, you'll have stuff that's scripted, you'll have it written on a board and then you'll just go through it. And then the next day, like you kind of mix it up like that, where you're, or do you have stuff that's like written out that, you know, like every Wednesday I'm going to hit this set of exercises. And, no, no, I yeah. usually, I, I like to, I don't like to know what I'm doing when I go in there. Okay. Yeah. Like, I like to have an idea of like, okay, you know, we're probably going to do like, I know that there's going to be a trap bar on this day, or I know that this is a conditioning day, so it's going to suck. But And I bring uh, that up because I think for a lot of like former athletes or people that have been working out for a while, it's, there's a bit of uh you do get into, it, it gets a little boring sometimes when you have yeah. like a controlled pattern. So when you have all this stuff that you can throw in there and then you can mix it up, uh, it helps. It helps. Yeah. The monotony. yeah. You know, and, it, and on those conditioning days, I always take my bow because it'll be, I'll have to get, cause you gotta think I'll do on the last exercise of like, we'll do four exercises, right? So you have 12 minute blocks. So you do three to four rounds of four different, four different supersets with, every minute on the minute. So in that last movement, I'll do, it might be a sled push, right? So I'll push the sled down and back. And then I get up the sled. I got to knock an arrow. I got to push that sled down and back, knock an arrow and make a good shot in that minute. And that's, you know, or I'll do like um, step ups or I'll do like some kind of care, some kind of farmer's carry um, for that last movement or, you know, something that's getting my heart rate up and making me tired and shaky and uncomfortable to where I'm making shot, I'm taking a shot. Um, and that's just like, I like to do that because I, I, I feel like it helps me. I feel like yeah. when I'm out there and I've got a full draw, I'm not like freaking out, you know? Cause I'm like, Oh shit, I'm so tired from hiking up here. Like I don't ever want to feel yeah. that way. And, I, and that comes from wrestling. Cause I, I, I've, I lost when I was young, when I was young, like my sophomore year, I lost matches to guys. Cause I just wasn't in good enough shape. And I was like, man, I'm never going to lose again because i was out of shape like and i'm never gonna not get i'm never not gonna not be able to take advantage of an opportunity out in the mountain because i'm not in shape like that's not going to be the factor that's not going to be the reason so that's how i look at it is like i'm not going to make it it's not going to be because i couldn't go up there because i couldn't i couldn't hack it i couldn't make it up there and and that's why i think it's guys come from me from the east coast and they come out here out west and they're like oh i'll be fine i've been walking on the stairmaster and this and that well when you when that altitude hits you and you're at like 10,000, you're at like nine to 10, 11,000 feet. Like it sucks. I don't care. I'm in really good shape, really good shape, cardiovascular shape. Like my cardiovascular is like on another level. And I still get so gassed hiking at like 10,000. Once I get past 9,000, it's like, it might as well be 20,000. I'm, I'm dying. Yeah. Like it sucks. I'm breathing heavy. Every step sucks. And then when you're big, all the oxygen that you have to, I need like three times the oxygen is the yeah, the dynamics of that work differently I move my legs, you know, and I need three times the water. I need three times the calories. So I have to carry more shit and it just, it, it is a disadvantage to be big out there. So I just want to make sure that I'm not going to be too tired to do it. This is another thing you mentioned when we were talking earlier about, um, being in the zone and, you know, you mentioned like your heart rate being at an increased level, having that, like, little bit of weak feeling. And um, so would you say that in these bursts of training, when you're in trying to be focused with your bow after doing hard physical exertion, um, that that replicates the adrenaline rise that can sometimes happen when that animal is coming in and you're in that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's what it is. Um, and it's funny because Western, it's so difficult to like keep yourself calm when you're sitting in a tree. Like for some reason, when I'm out like on the ground walking around and like bulls are running around everywhere and like cows are everywhere, like I don't get all jacked up about it. But when I'm in a tree and this buck is coming in, I'm like, I'm like losing my mind. The right? It's yeah. like, I'm like, it's like this, I'm trying everything, I'm doing everything I can to stay calm because I want to like, I'm like, oh, fuck, he's here, finally, like, oh, he's coming. And then you're like, you're just, like, every movement feels like you're just making so much noise, like, just like your your shirt brushing up against your ropes and, like, your tethers. There's such an advantage when you get out, when you can get out and hunt multiple times and have any age class deer come in. Like, and yeah. it's because you can practice that 
response that you have to it. Yeah. Because otherwise you may only get like this 10 seconds a year of a response to your biggest buck that year that comes in and however that played out, it determines your success. Well, um, well I'll do, I'll even, I'll even, when I'm in a tree, uh, if there's a buck coming by or I, I feel like it has to have antlers on it. Yeah. To like get you cause, cause any little buck will get you going, right? Like any little buck will be like, Oh, there's a buck. Like, you know, I've had little going. ones start making, you know, I'm like, what is going on? Why is my leg shaking? This, yeah, why am this I shaking? little, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll practice getting my bow. Cause like when the deer are coming in, you should have your bow in your hand. Mm -hmm. Like you should take your bow off the hook and get ready to, cause you don't know what's coming after that, that buck. Right. So that's what I'm already in position. I'll draw my bow back and just like anchor on him and just think like, okay, that's where I would stop him. You know, and then I'll let my bow down, right? It's like, I like I know that like there's an op opportunity to make a lot of noise there, but I also think it's really good, really important to practice that feeling of like, this is what it would feel like, you know, to like drop and really look through your peep and put your dot right on those vitals, like, and and not to and to not do it, to not release the arrow. Uh, there's a there's something about that control, right? That whenever the, the time actually comes, it's like, oh, okay do the same exact thing. Don't pay attention to the horns. Like you've seen the horns, that's the one you want. That's all right. Now let's, let's execute a good shot, you know, and an ethical shot. And I think a lot of people, a, a lot of people, I think they take unethical shots. I think it happens a lot because they're so jacked up and they're like, I'm just taking any opportunity I see, I'm taking it. And yeah. Sometimes they get into full draw and they just can't hold it. They just can't help themselves anymore. It's a split second decision. They yeah. can't. Yeah. 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 It happens. It's, you're taking unethical shots and they're wound, wounded deer, which sucks. But that's the only way you're going to learn is by, by taking shots at deer. Like you have to do it. Um, you have to, you have to, like the only way to get good at anything is to do it. Right. I don't care. You can go out and sit in the tree all you want. You can go out and hike the, hike the woods all you want, but until you've actually released an arrow on an animal, um, you, you haven't really practiced it. So you have to do it. You have to do it to get good at it. And unfortunately in hunting, your opportunities are minimal there, you know? So yeah. we do things like shoot at 3d targets and shoot at blocks and shoot at all, you know, shoot at targets. And, um, you know, the other thing I do is I, I will get down on my knees and shoot. I'll get down, you know, I'll sit on my butt and shoot. Like you never know what kind of position you're going to be in out there. Um, not everything happens the way you want it to. So you have to put yourself in awkward positions. Um, and then when it comes to like tree saddle hunting, that's like a whole nother way you have to, the way you have to cam up there in that, in that tree is just like, it's so different from standing on a platform. It's so it's, much different. There's a lot. Yeah. It's, it's much different. I've done it a small fraction of hunting mainly during gun season. Um, but there's a lot of different mechanics there and you've got all this in front of you that um you know i still prefer my my b stand but you know, <laughs> each his own <laughs> well i'm looking i i like the reason i like the saddle is because i don't have to like i feel like especially because i have somebody with me filming mm -hmm. so we can get up in that tree quick yeah you know what i mean and it's just because i haven't found and i also feel like because i'm so big that like on a platform sometimes i stick out like a big blob on the in the tree, you know what I mean? So it's like, I'm, at least I'm using the contour of the tree uh, to kind of look like maybe I'm a branch or, you know, like, you know, maybe I'm just an extension of the tree instead of just this blob off, off the end of the tree, you know? So um, it's, that's the other thing, man, that like, I'm still learning, like I, I hunted out of a climbing stand when I was a kid, you know, it was my buddy's climbing stand and that's how I learned how to hunt whitetail. And now that I'm like, saddle hunting and mobile hunting i'm like man where am i expecting these deer to come from so where should i position myself because that's the thing about like on a platform you have the disadvantage of things behind you right mm -hmm. so now i got to stand up and turn around it it's even worse in a saddle when things are coming from behind you like you have to like stand on that little platform with your back to the tree and in order to do that you have to make a lot of movement and it is like, I mean, it, it is just, I hate it. I hate it whenever I put myself on the wrong side of the tree. 
it takes it's it's practice, right? It's practice yeah. and thoughtfulness of where you set up and when with a tree stand or a saddle or a climber. I experienced the same thing. I used a climber a lot when I was uh, a kid and kind of through my twenties, like when I was in college. Um, and now I almost exclusively use, you know, a hang on. And it really is about like, it gives you, it gives you the ability when you're mobile, like you don't have to look for a certain type of tree. Like I get in all kinds of different types of crazy trees. Um, some that are probably not ethically trees I should be climbing, but th that was like tree, <laughs> the tree you need to be in, uh, for, for that hunt. And yeah, I think it, you know, you're not always going to get it right, but the more that you put yourself in those different situations, I think you start to see the patterns. You're like, oh, if I set up here and now I'm looking at how that little change in the thickness in the area, they're going to come through here. Sometimes it takes one sit in an area and you see how the deer move through it. I love when I can see, even it's, if it's not relatively close up, if I stage hunt, if I get one hunt and then I can get one more hunt, like a little closer and I actually see how animals move through an area. It's That's such key. an advantage. That is yeah. key. That is such like, I love that you said that because that's like, it, it's, it's true with all of these, even Western big game, like how, like, especially during the rut with these, with these elk, where, where are the cows moving? Because that's where the bulls are going. Like the bulls are going to follow those cows. The cat, these bulls are so like so horned up and stupid that they don't like that's their alarm system. Whatever the cows are doing, that's their only reason they're going to leave. The cows leave, they'll leave. So like, where are the cows going? What do they do? Like, how are they moving throughout the day? So like, that's how I'm paying attention to it, right? It's the same thing with whitetail. If I can get one good sit, right? Because there's not a lot of glassing in whitetail hunting, right? So you're not like getting on a ridge and glassing a whole herd of whitetail because they just it's not. That's not the way it goes down. Yeah, there's not. I mean, I, for the area I'm in, unless, you know, in the summer, you get summer glassing, but it's not during the hunting season, right? Yeah. Which Otherwise, it's shining at night. The pattern changes completely. Right. You know, because you got to think, when they have that velvet on their antlers, they're avoiding all the, all the prickly shit. To yeah, the pattern them. is completely different, and you're just... Your proximity hunting, but yeah, I know what you're saying, so... Yeah, like, yeah you know that that deer is over there, right? But he might be he might be way out of there right you know, he might leave there completely or the rut might hit and he might be gone he might go 20 miles away yeah you get these very very small windows where you can draw proximity between yeah. a summer feed in a field and the opener i mean we're lucky here in wisconsin we get that september opener so you got that there's like five days there where you can get them in yeah that pattern but it's <laughs> the people it's that so are successful doing it they like they figure out exactly where that deer is bedding and how they're getting up and moving. And sometimes yeah. it takes them years to do that, but yeah. they lock in on it and they can be very successful in that first week. Oh yeah. And it might, you're right, man. And they might hunt them for years, but, but I, but what you said about like being able to get into an area and just do like, if you know, like, Hey, I'm going to hunt this area for like three or four days. Right. Mm -hmm. if, especially if I, if I see deer like moving, then I know that like, okay, the next day I can go over here. That's the beauty of mobile hunting is that you're not stuck in one spot. Like I didn't go in there and do all this cutting and trimming to get these stick, get these, these big ladder up and or a ladder stand or something. Right. Like, I'm in a, I have a, I'm either in a, I'm a, I have a platform. Cause that's what it comes down to is you have a platform and you got four or five sticks yep. or maybe three sticks or whatever you're carrying, you're carrying. Um, these guys that do the one stick or they're just out of their mind to me. That's just crazy. Because I'm not hanging upside down on a tree doing that. I just can't do it. Yeah, <laughs> like I don't do that either. It's not safe no. to me. I'm, I'm I'm trying to come out of that. I'm trying to come out of there alive still. Yes. Or without a broken neck. But more power to them because they, they've figured it out. But, you know, I'm carrying four or five sticks with me. I got a platform. And whether I'm saddle hunting or I'm hunting from a regular platform, it's all the same. It's the same way you set up damn near the same. Like, it's all the same shit. So it's just what you prefer. And it's funny because as I get older here, I'm thinking more of like, I need to be standing on like a solid platform. You know, I just feel more comfortable there. I feel like I can do more while I'm up there, um, especially for filming purposes. Like it's just, just better, yeah. I think. And, 
anyways, if I can see what the deer are doing the next day, I can go. It's not a huge deal because I'm pulling my shit anyways. Right. I'm pulling my shit down out anyways. Like, cause I didn't plan on, unless, unless I, I was in the, unless you some miraculously found the right spot to be in for the next day and you leave them there, which has happened. You know, I have just left sticks there and pulled yep. the platform just in case, you know, cause the platform's the, the loudest part to put up in my opinion, you know? Um, so if I take the platform down, um, you know, whatever, because I could get those sticks down so quick. It takes, you know, five minutes to get your sticks down. Um, but, but if you could be up and up a tree, you could be up and set up in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Like that, it takes 10 minutes. It's not like it used to be where it was like, I need a whole afternoon <laughs> to yeah, set I need a whole down. afternoon to put a heavy hang on up or a ladder yeah. up, or and I need a guy to come out here and help me. That's you know, why I think, you know, it's become very popular because it it's, you can be independent. You can, you can practice your system. Like I'm sure you have a system, like your sticks are in a certain spot, your saddle's set up a certain way. You look for it to go up the tree a certain way and it's boom, 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 boom. You're set and ready to hunt. Um, it's what, what I like to tell people is you, you know, you kind of got to get in. There are hunts that you will have at the, at whatever point in the season. And sometimes you're sweating your ass <laughs> off and you're like, you oh. dropped like you dropped something and it made noise that you did, you know, it wasn't part of the plan. And you thought like you thought you got up in a tree and it looked like it was the right perspective, but now it's got you hanging sideways and you're not able to get shoot to that point that you thought you could. I mean, these things happen to everyone. You know? Oh yeah. It happens. I'll, I'll never forget the first time. So I watched the hunting public and saw those guys using tree saddles. And I was mm -hmm. like, that's a, that's the way to do it. So I like got on, ordered a tree saddle, uh, got some sticks. Like, so I don't even know what kind of sticks I got, just like some shitty sticks. And, um, I, I'm not good. They were muddy sticks. They weren't shitty, but they were like, yeah, not what I needed, not made for like my kind of weight and everything. And I go out and I'm like, oh, I already know I'm going to get this deer killed the first day. Like I already, this is the, this is the way I'm going to do it. And I get out there on the edge of this field and there's not a single tree I can find that makes any sense for me to get into. They're all <laughs> super skinny. And well, like, yes. Let's... Yeah, they're like skinny ass trees with like vines everywhere. Like I'm like, oh shit. So I'm sweating my, I mean, I am sweating my balls off. Like I am dripping sweat before I even get my first stick on a tree. Yeah. Because I'm like freaking out back there. <laughs> like I'm losing light. Like I'm all panicking. Or the lights, it's getting dark or it's yeah. getting light. So the light's coming up. So yep. Yep. we're going to start moving here soon and I'm fucking this up. And finally I find a tree that I think is going to be suitable. Right. So I get up, I throw four sticks on, I get up there and I go to dig my platform in and it goes damn near through the tree. Hmm. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, great. There's beetle rot all the way up here. And it like damn near goes through the tree. And I'm like, well, I'm not, I can't do this. Right. right. So I climb down and it's light now. And I'm like, yeah. okay. Now that's like, five and two fifty. You can't do that. No, that's not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was like 305 pounds. At the time. That. Yeah. You know, and I'm, I'm still like 290, 295. So it's like 285 usually is what I stay. You have to factor that in when you're picking trees. I mean, that's. Oh, well, you have to. And you have to think like, cause I see guys, I see these guys like these hunting public guys and like the seek one guys, they're hunting these little tiny trees sometimes. And I'm like, yeah. how, the, how the hell are they doing that? Uh, my camera guy, Levi Mayfield, he lives in Oklahoma and he, I mean, he is a deer killer. Like he finds them and kills them on public land. Nice bucks all the time. Sure. And sure. he does it because he can get in just about any kind of tree. Cause he's just little, you know, he's so, like 150 pounds. Yeah. Like he can get in any of those. There's an advantage. Trees. I'm only like 160 pounds and it does help to get into some real sketchy trees. Um, yeah. Cause I'm not, you know, it's worse now with the ash that like we're in like the 10th, the 10th year of the, the emerald ash borer. The emerald ash borers basically they're gone, but all the ash is dead and now it's really rotten. So there yeah. is a, like this winter, there's a lot of trees that fell. There's a lot of unsafe trees in these, these swamp areas that we hunt these transitions yeah. between the swamp and the high ground. And it just sucks, but yeah. So you end up setting up in shrubs and other weird stuff because there's just, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's, I even look at sometimes like hunting off these fingers that have like these fingers off of fields. They have like little trees in them. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and it was like, we had this opera. I was in Oklahoma hunting with, with Levi this year. Um, and he was like, man, if you just weren't so freaking big, like that tree right there is so, is so perfect. Cause we watched this buck the last two days do the same thing, mm -hmm. but he's just like, once he gets out into that field, he might go that way or that way. But like, he knows he comes through that, through that finger at the same spot all the time. Right. And it's like, if we can just get one day in that finger elevated a little bit, we'll be good. But the only tree that we could get in was like, you know, like yeah. that big around. And he's like, for me, that's no problem. He's like, but both of us up there, we can't do it. Yeah. That you thing's going to be swaying. Oh, it's going to be, we're going to be bent over this way. So yeah. he was just like, he's, you know, we just found a tree, got in it and still almost made it happen. And I just couldn't get a shot off at him. He just, just kind of hung out in that thick stuff. He's not stupid. Right. Um, and then, you know, it was one of those situations where I was like, man, if I just wasn't so big, I could have gotten that tree. No problem. Yeah. Like no problem. You got to hunt some more cattails. There's advantages with you being nice and tall to be sloshing through the cattails. Yeah. The problem that is, is it's not loud. advantage when you're short like me. No, but Well, the problem is, is they're so loud. Yeah. Yeah. I just, they're so loud and I'm just, and I, I, I'm sneaky, but I'm not that sneaky. <laughs> you know? Wow. But yeah, man, I, um, I appreciate you having me on them. And this is sure. Fun. Sure. Um, yeah, we've been on for about an hour and a half. So, um, this is great having you on. What else is going on that you want people to know about? I know you got your podcast, Wolf uh, Untamed. Yeah. yeah check out my ahead. podcast, Wolf Untamed. Um, we're revamping that. So we'll start new episodes, March 28th on those. Nice. Um, Ironclad. I'm working with Ironclad now. So we're going to be, you know, really pumping out some good content there. Uh, then you can follow my hunting adventures on YouTube, the Wolf Untamed yep. YouTube channel. And then uh, my website's going to be up here real soon. Um, and that's DerekWolf.com. Uh, check Very that good. out. Some cool merch. Uh, I'm doing a, a 3D archery shoot to help raise money for conservation um, to help stop these hunting bans that are going on in Colorado. Sure. It's going to be an invite only, 300 bucks to enter. Um, and then it's then it's going to be a seventy five hundred dollar uh, prize for the winner of the men's and the women's, and then twenty five hundred for the youth, which is ages thirteen to sixteen. Um, three grand Very for cool. second place, and then fifteen hundred for third place for the men's and women's. Uh, then the top five from all three of those is going to they're going to battle for the uh, alpha, and it's going to be an awesome hunting package. We got like Origin involved, I got Kasika involved, I got Kafaro involved, I got Hoyt involved. Um, looks like I'm going to have beast, yeah, gear, beast gear involved now too. So yeah. you're going to get a sweet setup, you know, and then, um, eventually, so next year, what I'm, st I'm putting the works on is I'm going to start doing, uh, you remember pimp my ride. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I'm I, remember, I used to, start yeah, I used to watch that show. Yeah. I'm going to start doing pimp my hunt because <laughs> people are always like, Hey, you should come hunt the, come, come hunt turkeys with me. Come do this. So I'm just going to like do a drawing and pick somebody every year and I'm just going to show up. Very cool. We're going to just pimp your hunt, new shotgun, new bow, new gear, new blind, new, whatever, you know, whatever kind of sponsors I can pick up on that, on that train. We're just going to hook it up for somebody. And I think that's why out. a lot of people relate to you, man. I think you, you know, when I first talked to you, I, I, I could feel like you're just down to earth and you give back. Um, I think that's really important. Thank you for yeah, that. Man, that's what, well, that's the most important part of this is that like, if we don't pass this on, it's not going to survive. You know, this way of life is going to go down the drain because, you know, we have to get the young kids involved and that's how you do it. You know, you make it fun for them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not expecting these older guys, you know, older, older guys to think this is cool, but I do expect the younger kids, like these high school kids and these, you know, kids that are coming out, you know, 20 year olds, I'm thinking like 16 to 20 is probably like going to really think this is badass. Yeah. And we're just going to show up like at your spot <laughs> and be like, Hey, we're here. Look at all this gear we brought you. Yeah, we Let's have to adjust to the mindset of the generation to get them excited about it because yeah. there's a lot of positive stuff that can be had with engaging in the outdoors for sure. Yeah. For and there's sure. not a lot of there's not a lot of like there's mentor groups for football and there's mentor groups for basketball and all these other sports. There's ways to be a mentor to these young kids. But there's no way there's it's hard unless like you're somebody in your family or one of your close friends or somebody passed the hunting traditions down to you, then you probably weren't introduced to it. Right. You know, and it's like more and more, these kids are uninterested in it just because it's not, it, there's no instant gratification. 
Yeah. Right. So if you can find ways to mentor kids, um, which that would be great. Like I'm working on that now, trying to figure out ways to do it. It's, it's tough because the organizations that are out there, Boys and Girls Club and stuff, they don't really want to involve kids in hunting. You know, they, it's, it's silly, but whatever. Yeah. So I'm thinking about ways to, to like, you know, I have the Wolfpack Foundation, um, which works with at, at risk youth and veterans and Very we do nice. all kinds of cool stuff. Um, so I'm thinking about ways, how can I like involve, how can I get kids that like just, because when I was a kid, I had a hand-me-down bow from one of my friends. And when I outgrew that bow, I had to stop bow hunting. Like, that's really why, you know, I didn't have the time, but I also didn't have a bow. And yeah. I didn't have two, I didn't have 1500 bucks to go drop on a bow or 700 bucks or even the cheapest bow as well, 500 bucks. You know, I didn't have that that kind of money to yeah. do that. So. I, I was fortunate as well. I mean, I my my dad was was born in Italy and he came over to the United States, but he was big into hunting waterfowl and small game. And then when he met people, when we moved to Wisconsin, they introduced him to whitetail hunting, which then they also introduced him to fishing and all this other stuff. And then as a kid, it's like those people like pulled us into this whole, you know, expanded into this whitetail hunting and then they would do trap shooting and then they would go rabbit hunting. I mean, I went rabbit hunting all the time with my dad, you know, we do pheasant goose hunting and all that stuff. Yeah. And it's like the friends and the camaraderie that were built through that. So it's important to have those mentors, someone that pulls Absolutely. you into it. Absolutely. And you know, that's the best part about it is the camaraderie. I think, you know, the, the com I just started getting into waterfowl too. And that is like, the ball busting that goes on is so much fun. You know, like it's like a locker room. Yeah. I feel like you're in a locker room talking shit to each other. It's so much fun. Um, yeah. It's one of those things when you're deer, out of practice. Deer camp, deer, the best part about deer camp is like at night when everybody's back talking shit to each other. Yeah. So everybody saw a giant buck. I'm like, I know everybody did not see a giant buck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. It's, it's fun to share this stuff with, with others and have that camaraderie. Um, and it's, that's why it, you know, it's not necessarily about the success. I mean, I, I volunteer at a conservancy and we have a group of people that maintain the property and do work on the land. And, um, it's that same sort of camaraderie every year we talk about how we gotta, you know, the work we got to put in and, and things that we got to take care of. But then during the year, it's constant, you know, text messages and talking about, Hey, what did you see and what's moving on the, you know, and everyone's asking about how everyone else is doing. And that's part of the camaraderie of the outdoors. It's really cool. Yeah. And being happy. That's the other thing, like being happy for, you know, somebody when they, when they are successful. Yeah. Like it's, it's, I get the same, it was like the same thing with, you know, Von Miller and I were really good friends and we worked together a lot. I mean, for eight years, we played next to each other and mm -hmm. worked off of each other a lot. Like if he made a play, it was like I made a play and sure. then it was vice versa for him. So that's the way I feel about, you know, hunting is like when, when one of my buddies, you know, is successful, I feel just as excited. Like, it's like, I can't wait to see the deer. I can't wait to see the turkey. I can't wait to see your, your, whatever it is that you, you were hunting that you were successful on. Right. Uh, I'm just as happy as, as if I, I did it. Um, so, so yeah, there's a lot to be learned from this, from this way of life, man. And a lot of good, good life lessons. It's not just, uh, soulless, heartless killers out there, man. It's not what it's no. about. No, you know, the kill is secondary. It's about the journey and it's about the fun that you get to have the camaraderie, the brotherhood, the, the sisterhood. There's a lot of women getting involved in this. this and that, sure. that's the other thing. This sport is for everybody. Like it is, you want to talk about something that's inclusive. Like this is the most inclusive. You, everybody, like everybody can do this. Everyone. There's not a, well, a, like the way the, the system, they have people that are completely paraplegic that are able to use their mouth to, to shoot a gun now. So anybody can do this, man, woman, white, black, purple, green, whatever. It doesn't matter. Everybody can do this. It's for everyone. And that's the great part about this community is they, the, the, the left would like to, to paint us as these uh, redneck, racist idiots, ignorant idiots. But that's like, could be further. That couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah. Uh, that's... Any, I've never seen, I've never been to a hunt camp and been like, oh, that was kind of racist never felt that way. Right. Like, and, and I've been in hunting camps with like all, all walks of life. Right. You know, it's just like a locker room. I never was in a locker room and felt like, Oh, that's, that's kind of racist. Never felt that way. Yeah. Never, never felt. I never felt like 
I didn't want to include anybody in, in hunt camp. I never felt like I didn't want to include anybody in the sport. Like it just, anybody can do it. So everybody's welcome. Cause I don't think that's a, none of that is a point of focus. It's not, it's the point of focus is like the experience of the outdoors, the hunt, the camaraderie, the, the embracing each other's stories. You know, that's what everyone is. How can I make the others around me more successful? Like you talked about in the locker room, like hunting is, is not much different when, when you have your core group of people that you keep in contact with during the year. I mean, I, for sure with how busy I am, I, I am super thankful for my friends and family members that hunt because they, they hook me up with different spots to go to as well. They're like, well, yeah. you know, come try, come try over in this area. You know, I did some scouting over here and it looks good. I haven't had a chance to hunt it. You go hunt it. You know, there's that give and take that's in the hunting community. And um, yeah, it's, it, it really is a place for everyone. And I think the outdoors and just being close to what happens in nature. When you do a, when you do a sun up sit or you do an evening sit or you do an all day, you know, sun up, you move and then do an evening sit, observing the kind of the cycle of life that happens throughout that or over several days, everyone's got to experience it. Yeah, I agree. Everybody should experience it. I think it's great. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, it's, it's a hell of a way of life and I love it. Well, thank you very much again. I appreciate your time. I know you're very busy and much appreciated. And uh, yeah, we'll keep in touch. Thanks, man. Yeah, we got a good snowstorm coming. So we're going to try to get up on the slopes, and catch some of this powder. Nice. Nice. Very good. All right. All right, brother. Take care. Bye. Bye.